All right. Um, so we kind of switched gears last class, um, talking about hypothesis testing. We're going to be doing a lot of that over the next, up into the next exam, also even after the exam. So really try to, if you have any questions as we're going through it, make sure you kind of stop me so we make sure we get a pretty good handle on what we're doing here. So we left off last class, kind of using that court case analogy, just to kind of a different way of thinking about null alternative hypothesis, right? So what we're going to do, right, we're not doing a court case example. What we're going to be doing is trying to test for where that true population mean is, okay? So we have our null and our alternative hypothesis. Just a reminder, we write the null H subscript zero, zero kind of being null, and then the alternative H subscript A, okay? So we have three different types of tests, right? A greater than, a less than, and a not equal to. So remember, the null is what we're assuming is true. So here we've assumed that the true population mean is less than or equal to some value. So this mu subscript zero, in practice, when we write this out, that will be a number. That'll be the number that we're assuming the true mean is less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to, or this third one, we're just assuming that the true population mean is exactly equal to a certain number. So if we look at kind of thinking about the null alternative being, I, I, you know, we talked about they're kind of complements of each other. Notice if I'm assuming that the true mean is less than or equal to say 50, the alternative hypothesis would be that it's greater than 50, right? Oh, we got a bunch of people coming in, there we go. So um, if I look at the names of these tests, they line up with whatever's in the alternative hypothesis, right? So notice if there's a greater than sign, that's a greater than test. If there's a less than sign in my alternative hypothesis, that's a less than test. And if there's a not equal to sign, it's a not equal to test. Right? So we call these two, right? Sometimes instead of greater and less than, I'll call these right and left tailed, right? So greater than, right? If I'm thinking about a distribution, if it's greater than, it's on the right side of the distribution. So greater than or right tailed test. Less than, I'm looking at the left side of that, right? Less than to the left, so left tailed test. And then not equal to, you can imagine if I'm assuming that the true population mean is equal to 50, well then if I see something on either side, right, let's say I see 62 or I see 41, those are both evidence that the true mean isn't maybe 50, right, it doesn't matter if it's above or below there, because on either side that would be evidence that goes against what I've assumed to be true, right. If I assume that, in, you know, that the true mean is less than or equal to 50 and I see 41, well, that's okay. That actually supports the null. That would not be evidence against the null. So here, when we have this equals in our null um, hypothesis, we also can think about this as kind of a two-sided or two-tailed test. Okay? So here, only one side matters. And as we work through more examples, I'll kind of reiterate this. Um, and then here, when we have a not equal to sign in the alternate hypothesis, kind of both sides matter, both tails matter. We have a two-tailed test. And I don't know if we'll quite get there today to making sure you know, we understand the importance of this, but once we start to calculate things like p-values, it becomes important whether or not it's a one or a two-tailed test. Right? We do things a little bit differently. Okay? So here's gonna be our, our steps. First, we identify, are we looking for a population mean, population proportion, what's the statistic, the po you know, population statistic we're interested in? That is, we'll kind of do this intuitively. Determine if it's a one or a two-tailed test. Really, this is being able to identify what the null, null and alternative hypothesis are. And then from there, hopefully, we can go back here and say, oh, yeah, the only two-tailed test is when I have a not equal to sign in that alternative hypothesis. The other tests are one-tailed tests. Okay. And then the third final step, when we're writing out this null and alternative hypothesis, we need to make sure we include the equality somewhere. So you'll notice here... I always include the equality in the null hypothesis. I think that's just the easiest kind of convention to use because when we look at that two-tailed test, the equal sign literally is the null hypothesis, right? Is the population mean equal to a certain value? So then when we look at the greater than or less than tests, we don't have just greater than or less than, we have less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, right? We include that equality in the null. I don't know if we'll talk about today, Friday, for sure I will, but I'll show you why it doesn't really matter eventually. It doesn't really matter if we put the equality in the null or if we put it in the alternative, but it can only be in one of them, right? If I say greater than or equal to here, this is less than, 
if I instead change this to just being greater than, then I would have to have less than or equal to in the alternative, right? Still this idea of complements, right? And so if I include the equality on both, well, they're no longer complements because there'd be one value that could be in both the null and alternative. So if we go back to the example that we talked about last class, so we want to test whether or not the average mass market beer has a lower ABV than 7%. Okay, so that's what we want to test for. The way we construct these null and return hypothesis, the null, right, is what we're going to assume is true. And it's what we say we want to test against. Whatever I'm trying to test for, that's going to be my alternate hypothesis. If I'm interested in finding, does the average mass market beer have an ABV less than 7%, I'm going to assume the opposite is true. So I'm going to assume it's greater than or equal to 7%. And then that will be my null. So this was the idea that we're stacking the deck against ourselves. So when you go into a court case, you don't you know, assume the person's guilty. We assume they're innocent, right? We're trying to make it harder for us to prove what we want to prove, which is that they're guilty. Here, what we want to find is that the average, true population average is less than 7%. So we'll assume the opposite is true. That it's greater than or equal to 7 for our null, okay? So... You know, if we wrote this out in English, our null would be, does the you know, mean mass market beer ABV, is it not lower than 7%, not lower than greater than or equal to, which is the alternative is the exact opposite of that, which is that it is lower than the 7%. Or if we wrote this out in the way we're going to, right, kind of mathematically, we assumed it was greater than or equal to 7% to stack the deck against ourselves. We included that equality in the null hypothesis which meant then the alternative was just the complement of that, which is that the true mean is less than 7%, right? So if we think about what we're gonna be doing here is we can only see one sample, right? We're gonna see a sample mean, we can calculate a sample mean from that sample. If the sample mean, let's say the sample mean was 8.2%. Well, that actually supports the null, right? 8.2% from my sample mean would be evidence that the true mean is greater than or equal to 7%. So there, I'm not going to be rejecting the null. But if I see something like, I don't know, 6.2%, well, that goes against the null because 6.2 is not less, sorry, it's not greater than or equal to 7%. But is it far enough away from that assumed true value for me to be able to reject that null hypothesis? So that's what we're going to try to figure out now. So um, before we, we do that, go, go to kind of that example, I just want to make sure we can identify these null alternative hypotheses. Okay, so let's say we had a different example where we want to test for whether or not the mean retirement age is different than 67. So if what I want to find is that the true mean is different than 67, right, I assume the opposite is true and make that my null. So if I just want to find is it different than 67, what am I really saying mathematically there? Is it any other number than 67? which would mean, is it not equal to 67, right? So anytime I see this terminology of different than, right, is it different than this one value? What I'm really just saying, is it not equal to that value, right? Is it any other value other than 67? Well, if that's what I want to test for, I assume the opposite is true, which is that the true mean actually is equal to 67, right? So my null hypothesis here should be that the true mean is equal to 67, the complement of that would be that the true mean is anything other or not equal to 67. So anytime we see this terminology of different than a certain value, it should be actually kind of easy to identify the null alternative because different than, you should be thinking automatically, I have a, if I can get back here, not equal to test, right? Is it just different than this value? It could be above it, could be below it. So we've got this two-tailed or not equal to test, okay? So here, if we're looking at that, right, we settle on B is going to be our correct answer. Okay. So ultimately, what we're trying to do is be able to reject the null or fail to reject it. Right? So based off of our sample evidence, can we reject what we assume to be true or do we not have enough evidence to go against it and we fail to reject? Right? So in that process, right, we can make mistakes. Right? So we're incorrectly gonna be rejecting the null sometimes, right? So we'll, we'll reject the null when in fact we shouldn't have. So I'll give a little bit of sneak peek here. But if we take a sample and I calculate a sample mean, if I know my sample size, I know the population variance, I know that the distribution of my sample means will be centered around whatever that true population mean is, 
So what we're going to do, excuse me, is if we have a null hypothesis that it's greater than or equal to, or it's equal to a certain value, then because we can't see the true population mean, we're going to assume that what we assume to be true is in fact true. And if that value that we said, you know, is the true mean retirement age equal to 67? Well, that's what we're assuming is true, right? We're kind of assuming that's equal to 67. So I know my sample means, if that was the true population mean, would be centered around that, right? That's what we kind of talked about, the distribution of sample means. We talked about it prior to confidence intervals and with confidence intervals. So if I see something like, I don't know, 65, right? Well, if I was assuming that the true mean was 67, this is sample evidence, right? This was my sample mean. That goes against what I assume to be true, but I mean, if the true mean retirement age was 67, and let's say the standard deviation of my sample means was relatively high, it's not that unlikely that I see 65 as my sample mean, right? I could make this even more ridiculous. Let's say I take a sample and I see 66.8. Well, yeah, that's not 67, so that's still evidence that goes against what I assume to be true. But right, if the true mean was 67, it'd be very likely I see 66.8, right? So even though I'm finding evidence that goes against that, that assumed true value, it may not be enough evidence. And so what we're gonna eventually hopefully get to is, is the sample mean we found, even if it's inconsistent with what we assume to be true, is it inconsistent enough that we can reject, right? You can imagine in this scenario, Let's say instead, I see a sample mean of, I don't know, this is ridiculous in the context of the example, but let's say I see a sample mean of 50 for the mean retirement age. Well, if the true mean is 67, it's almost impossible that from a sample mean, especially if my sample size is relatively high, that I'm gonna see a sample mean of 50, right? That probability is essentially zero, which probably means what I assume to be true isn't in fact true, because if it was, that probability is just, I mean, I didn't even draw it out that far, right? It's just so low. So what's probably true, if I see a sample mean that's that low, is that the true mean and the true distribution of my sample means is probably somewhere over here. I don't know, like a lot lower, right? So we're using this distribution because we're, we, we have an assumed true value. We're trying to see whether or not we can reject that as the assumed true value. If I see a sample mean that far away from what I assume to be true, yeah, it probably isn't true. It's probably more likely the actual distribution of my sample means should be centered around a much lower value, okay? So that's, you know, just kind of give us a little bit of context to what we're doing. We'll go over this in more detail here in a second. But even if we follow this process where, you know, even when we see values that are really far away, right? It could be that even though I saw 50, and it had a really low probability of occurring, it still has a probability of occurring that's greater than zero, right? So I still could see it, it's just very, very unlikely. So sometimes I might see this and say, okay, I can reject this value of 67 as the true mean, but in fact, if it actually was 67, I'd be wrong. I shouldn't have been rejecting it. I just happened to see a sample mean that had a relatively low probability of occurring. So I will reject the null sometimes when I shouldn't be, right? And we're going to call those type one errors, okay? We'll incorrectly fail to reject the null as well. So sometimes, right, we'll see sample evidence that looks like it's close to the assumed true value, but it just so happened that, you know, my sample was, oh, go here. So it could be that, let's say I saw 66.8, so I don't reject that assumed true value because it's pretty close to it, right? Well, if in fact the true mean was 55, I should have been rejecting 67 because the true mean wasn't 67. It's just that I had a relatively low probability of seeing that sample mean if the true value is 55. And so it's, you know, sometimes I'll be reject, or sorry, sometimes I'll be failing to reject when I in fact should have. Now, and I'm saying all this, like we can actually observe the population mean, we usually can't, right? That's the problem, right? And so, we know, but, but we know that we'll make these errors. Regardless of whether or not we're actually able to confirm that we made these errors you know, down the road is a different story, but we know that we will make them. 
right? So type one error is when I reject the null, even though I shouldn't have been. Type two error was when I was failing to reject the null, even though I should have been, right? So we can kind of think about if you set this up, let's say I rejected the null hypothesis when in fact it was false, right? So I should have been rejecting it. That's a correct decision. If I failed to reject it when it in fact was true, like let's, let's say, you know, I do my hypothesis test and then I don't know, the next day I'm able to actually observe the population data. Well, if I fail to reject it when in fact it was true, that's a good decision as well. So if I reject it, even though it was true, I made a type one error there. Right? I rejected when I shouldn't have. And then if I failed to reject when it was false, so I should have rejected it, but I didn't, that's a type two error, okay? So we'll get an idea of this, this type one error today. I probably will actually, I think I got some slides here I'll skip over because I know we're not gonna have time to get to the type two error today or I don't wanna take the time today to do it. And we'll kind of focus on it a little bit more on Friday or possibly even push that discussion off to Monday because for right now the type two error um, isn't as important to what we're gonna do, okay? So what we're gonna call this type one error is we're gonna start notating it as alpha. Okay, so alpha is going to be our significance level, right? So we start to think about, well, sorry, I'll say this. It's the significance level in decimal form. So if I have an alpha of say 0.1, that's the significance level of 10%. We can start to think eventually visually, alpha is going to be a certain area in the tail of my distribution. So it's going to represent a probability but I can convert that into a significance level saying that as a percentage pretty easily by just multiplying by 100, right? So if I have an alpha of 0 0.01, that would be the 1% significance level, right? And what alpha represents is the probability that I am making a type one error in, during my hypothesis test. Or said differently, if I look at the significance level, the significance level is the percent of times I will be making a type one error. Right, so alpha just represents our type one errors, okay? Any questions on that before we keep moving? Also, I, before I forget, I wanted to mention, I don't know, uh, and, and this <laughs> kind of goes uh, moving forward. If for some reason the lecture slides aren't posted, someone emailed me today and asked if I could post them. I didn't realize they weren't up there. They were up there for all my other sections. I must have like left the web page before they finished uploading when I kind of dragged them over. Um, so they should be up there now. Uh, I apologize for that, but, but yeah, let me know if they're, they're not showing up for some reason. They always should be there, okay? All right, um, so if we think about type one, type two errors, let's start out with the assumption that someone's not pregnant, all right? So we're, we're gonna assume that the person, the null hypothesis is that they're not pregnant. A type one error would be if we reject that null, so we reject that they're not pregnant, when in fact, or, uh, clearly they aren't, right? So rejecting that they're not pregnant, telling them, no, you are. This is clearly a type one error, right? We rejected that the person wasn't pregnant, even though clearly they're not pregnant, right? So type two error would be if we failed to reject, right? We say if the null hypothesis is that you're not pregnant and we failed to reject that, even though very clearly we should have been rejecting, that would be evidence of a type two error, right? So here, if we think about this example, if we started out with a null hypothesis being that someone is not pregnant, Type one error would be when we reject, even though we shouldn't have been. Type two, we failed to reject, even though clearly we should have been rejecting, okay? All right, so we've got this idea of a type one error, right? So it's gonna be when we, re we reject the null hypothesis, even though it in fact is true and that we shouldn't have been rejecting it, okay? So that's our alpha. 1 minus alpha is going to be the probability that we don't make a type 1 error. Or said differently, if we could think about alpha was the probability I make a type 1 error, 1 minus alpha is the probability that I'm not making a type 1 error, right? We're kind of making that correct decision. Um, we will essentially, whatever problem we're looking at, it's kind of like confidence intervals. We choose, or in problems you're working on, you're being told what level of confidence you want. 90, 95, 99% confidence. Here, you'll be told whether or not you wanna look at one, five or 10% significance levels, right? So alpha is gonna be kind of told you or you're choosing it, I guess, if, if you're like the researcher, okay? So typically we set them at low values. Um, hopefully we'll see, we see, you know, well, I, I can tell you right now. So let's say we think about alpha of 0.05, right? What that's really saying is we're making type one errors 
the probability to make a type one error is about 0 0.05, where we make type one errors 5% of the time. What that's really saying is that 95% of the time, we're not making a type one error. Or we can kind of think about 95% confidence. So all these three, three significance levels, you can think of them as confidence levels as well. So if I'm looking at the 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01 for my alpha, that's the 10, the 5, and the 1% significance levels. Well, if I'm looking at the 10, the 5, and the 1% significance levels, the probability that I'm not making a type, error, type 1 error would be 90, 95, and 99%. Or 90, 95, 99% confidence that I'm not making a type 1 error. So we can kind of go back and forth between these significance levels and kind of what the confidence level would be there. Um, and I think I've, I've kind of just reiterated this. I've said this several times, but here we kind of had another, another point in the slide where I'm just really trying to get, you know, alpha is 0.05. It's the 5% significance level, which means we're making type one errors 5% of the time, or we're rejecting the null when we shouldn't have been 5% of the time, which means we won't be making a type one error 95% of the time. Yeah. When you say the word set, like if you set, you just, like if you set an alpha, it finds the Oh, so, so we'll go back to confidence intervals since we've won over that already. You choose, if, I, if I'm only doing one confidence, confidence interval, I'm choosing the level of confidence I want to, I want to build that interval for, right? I can, I'm either building the 90% confidence interval, I'm building the 99% confidence interval. Here's the same idea. I'm either going to be making my rejection decision at the 1% significance level, at the 5% significance level, or at the 10% significance level. Does that help clarify what? So it's not that, you know, we're setting alpha. We could, we could test against, you know, in theory, like if I set it up in Excel, eventually we'll see, I could, I could set alpha to be an infinite number of values, theoretically. I could test against a, ton, like, 0 0.001, 0 0.002, 0 0.003. 0 I can test it, but every single alpha, I'd have to, is essentially a, another hypothesis test. Just like every time we chose another level of confidence, that was a whole nother confidence interval we had to build. Okay. Does that help kind of, okay. Uh, like I said, we'll kind of gloss over type two errors for today. I want to get to kind of some, some problems. So, and this is, uh, I thought a great meme that I, I found when, when Googling this. So, Hey girl, I made a type one error. I shouldn't have rejected you, right? Because I rejected when I shouldn't have, type one error. Okay, might be a good way to remember it. So we're gonna conduct this hypothesis test. And what we're really trying to find is, okay, I've got this assumed true value. Is the sample evidence I found inconsistent with that assumed true value or that assumed true state of nature? So the first thing I, you know, I'm gonna assume that whatever my null hypothesis, whatever I assume to be true is in fact true. If my sample evidence goes against it, then possibly I'll reject it, right? However, you can kind of imagine if I've got a null hypothesis, let's say the null is, I don't know, the mean is greater than or equal to 70. Well, if my sample mean is 72, that supports my null hypothesis, so of course I'm not going to reject it, right? The only sample mean values for which I could even possibly reject the null would have to be something less than 70, right? And then once it's, so once my sample evidence is inconsistent with my null, then I have to figure out, is it inconsistent enough, right? So the next step would be, oops, to either use the p-value or critical value approach. So today we'll just talk about the p-value approach. Next class, we'll talk about the critical value. They both lead us to the same rejection decision. So it doesn't matter which one we use, and hopefully, I think understanding both of them will give you a little bit better idea. Once we get through both, it'll give you a broad, broader kind of understanding of, of hypothesis testing. Okay. So let's go back to our example and figure out how we actually find these p-values, right, for the p-value approach, and how these p-values allow us to start to make rejection decisions at different levels oops, of alpha here. And I'll kind of compare alpha to the p-value and talk about why, why that relationship allows us to make a rejection decision. So let's say we've got that null alternative hypothesis that we had earlier, where we want to test for whether or not the average ABV is less than 7%. So we assume that it's greater than or equal to 
And also here I wrote the alternative hypothesis a little bit differently. You might see this if you're looking at, I don't know, if you Google search hypothesis test help, or you're looking at, I think even the book, instead of H subscript A, sometimes you'll see the alternative hypothesis written as H subscript one. Okay, so just wanted to mention that here. So if I look at this and I think about what type of test I have, I have a less than sign in my alternative hypothesis. So I have a left tailed test. So let's think about why it's a left tailed test or why, you know, it's a less than, but we can also think about it as a left tailed. So I assumed that it was what? Greater than or equal to 7%. So when I think about the distribution of my sample means, I can also almost think about it this way. If I use the, the cutoff, the kind of lowest value in this range, or I use the cutoff value for this range of 7% as the assumed true mean, if I see a sample mean anywhere in this range, right, anything above 7%, that would support the null hypothesis. So the only thing for a left tailed test that I might reject the null is if I see something on the left side of the distribution, right? If I see anything over here, these are potential sample means for which I could say, based off my sample evidence, I can reject that assumed true mean. So the left tailed test is really saying, only sample evidence or only sample means on the left side of that distribution would be values that you could possibly reject the null with. Okay. So let's say we take a sample of size 36. What would the distribution look like? Well, if we've assumed that it's greater than or equal to 7%, for now, just believe me and I'll kind of show you here in a second, but let's just choose whatever that cutoff is, whatever the value in our null hypothesis is, it is greater than or equal to, let's use kind of that lowest value, that 7%. We'll assume that that's our population mean. We then know our sample means will have to be normally distributed around that population mean if we took a sample size over 30, which we did here, right? That was just kind of that central limit theorem. So I know that if I see 4.5, it's not very likely if the true mean is 7%, right? Whereas 6.7, would be a lot more likely of a sample mean for me to see if the true mean was 7%. Now, both of these values are evidence that goes against my null hypothesis, but I need to figure out is 4.5 enough evidence against seven being the true value to which I can reject it? Is 6.7 enough evidence um, to which I can reject it? And what this really depends on is what's the variance of this distribution, right? Because if the variance of this distribution is relatively high, then I might, it might not be very unlikely for me to see a value of 4.5 that that's, that is that far away from the mean. But if the variance is really, really, really low, right? Well then even maybe seeing a value of 6.7 could be really unlikely if the variance is really, really low. Because remember, if the variance is low, that means the probability of seeing values really, really close to the population mean would be very high or we'd have a really peaked distribution, right? Now, of course, if we see sample evidence over here, I mean, how likely would that be? Well, if the true mean is greater than or equal to 7%, right? These are values that support that null. We're for sure not gonna be rejecting the null hypothesis there, right? So we don't have to really worry. These would be values for which we don't have to do the p-value approach. We automatically know we're not gonna be rejecting the null if we see 8.5 or 9.5. So let's keep going, one, one more step. So obviously 5.5 and 6.7 um, go against it, but do they go against that assumed true value enough, All right? So um, we've got that sample size of 36. We have our sample mean value that we saw. We have this assumed true mean. The final thing that we're gonna need to know is what the population variance is, okay? So we're gonna assume in these first examples that yes, I can't see the population mean, but I somehow have information on the population variance. It's kind of like with the confidence intervals. This is an unlikely scenario. It might exist if we like know the variance on some machine process, but we can only pull a certain number off the assembly line. But we'll start here and then move to examples where what if we don't know the population variance? So what we're going to do is create something called this Z statistic or test statistic. So what this test statistic is gonna tell me, it's very similar. So test statistic is kind of the broader term. This would be 
you know, we could calculate test statistics for the, the, the population mean, population proportion, um, population correlations, right? We could do this for all, every other types of statistics. When we do it for the sample mean where we know the population variance, we're just gonna call that a Z statistic because if we know the population variance, just like with confidence intervals, we know we can use that standard normal distribution or that Z table, right? So why does this test statistic help us? So let's say, and I think I have this in the slides, but I'll get it to you a little bit early. Let's assume, I don't know, we know the population variance here is one, right? Or 1% ABV. I knew my sample size was 36. If 7% was the true population mean, what would have to be true about the distributions of my sample mean of size 36? Well, I know that they'd be normally distributed around the population mean. And right now we don't know what it is, but we have an assumed true value for the population mean. We also know that the standard deviation of our sample means is equal to the population variance over my sample size. Well, we have both those things. Right? And if I see a sample mean of 4.5, how likely was it that I saw something that was this far away from the population mean, or here the assumed true population mean, or anything even further? Well, I didn't leave myself a lot of room, so I'll actually write this above. I usually like to write it below it, but that's okay. Doesn't really matter. Well, I can turn my sample mean into a z-score. I can then look that z-score up and find what's the probability I saw that z-score or anything to the left. Okay. So how likely was it, if this was the assumed true, if this population mean that we assumed to be true was in fact true, how likely was it that I saw something that was this far away from that, that mean or even further or that many standard deviations away, right? Because the Z value represents the number of standard deviations away or anything even further away. So how are we going to get that Z value? Well, anytime we want a Z value, we take the sample statistic we're interested in, which here, 4.5. We subtract the mean. Well, here we don't have a mean, but we have an assumed true mean, right? And then we divide by the standard deviation of whatever statistic we're looking at. We're looking at sample mean. So the standard deviation of our sample means here, which would be the square root of the population variance over the sample size, which we you know, could plug in one and 36 there as well. So that's where that test statistic or that Z statistic equation comes from. All we're really doing is taking the sample mean that we found and converting it into a Z score. It's just that when we convert it into a Z score, we don't have a true population mean now, but we have an assumed true population mean. So what the Z statistic is telling us is not the number of standard deviations away from the population mean that we are, but it's the number of standard deviations away we are from the assumed true population mean. And so once we find that probability, you know, let's say I look this up and I find, I don't know, this is 0 0.002. What that's really telling me is if this was the assumed true population mean, the probability I saw 4.5 from a sample of size 36 as my sample mean, the probability I saw something that far away from, from the mean would be about 0 0.002, or really that it's very unlikely that I saw this as a sample mean if this in fact was the true population mean. And because it's so unlikely, I'm actually okay rejecting this as, as the true population mean value. Because it, it's so unlikely that I would see this as my sample mean if this was in fact the true value, that I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I feel justified in saying it, it probably isn't the true value. Okay? Now, if we think about this, there will be times, even if so let's say this was the true value. Let's say the value I assumed it was seven, and in fact, it ends up being seven. There will still be times where I see sample means out here that I would reject this assumed true value, but I shouldn't have been, right? Even though they had low probabilities of occurring, I, I, 
I would be rejecting this, but you know, it still was coming, it really was that this was a true population mean. It just so happened that I saw a sample mean that was very unlikely, right? So we're not gonna be right all the time. We're gonna be making errors, type, type one errors, whatever level we set alpha at, because ultimately our rejection decision, we go here, I think I have it in the slides in the next one. So I'll talk about, come back to this here in a second. There we go. Ultimately, our rejection decision is going to be when we find this probability from, from the table, right? Once I find this probability, we're going to call this my p-value. If that probability is less than whatever alpha I set, then I'm going to reject. So really what I'm saying is if I set alpha to be 0.05, then anytime I get a sample mean that corresponds to a probability that's less than 0.05, I'll be rejecting this assumed true value. Now, when I make that rejection decision, even if in fact it was the true value, I would be incorrect for any value that gives me a probability less than alpha, right? And so that, that's why it's telling us we're gonna be making errors alpha kind of times 100% of the time. So let's go through a little bit more. I'll, I'll kind of revisit that idea, but let's talk a little more about these p-values, right? So I've kind of set up the idea of what we're doing with p-values already. But once we have this test statistic, for that left tail test in the example we had, it's pretty easy, right? So for a left tail test, once I have my test statistic, I just turn it into a Z, you know, a Z statistic. Sorry, once I have my sample mean, I turn it into a Z statistic. I look it up in the table. The table tells me the area to the left. That's my p-value, right? My p-value is the probability I saw something that was that far away from the assumed true mean, if in fact it was true, or even further away, okay? Now, I'm not using the terminology of even less than because sometimes, instead of a left tail test, we'll have a right tail test. So for a right tail test, that was in the alternative hypothesis, we had a greater than sign. So that would be where only values up here would be evidence that goes against the norm. So if I have a right tail test, what ends up being true is whatever sample mean value I see, I'll turn that into a z-score. But now I want, you know, I'm thinking about only evidence on the right hand side would go against the null. And so when I look up the z-score now for a right tail test, I want to find the probability I saw something that far away from the assumed true mean or even further away or even greater, right? So for a left and a right tail test, we're really looking at different sides of the distribution. Now, one way to get around this is if we just say the probability that I saw this z statistic, this test statistic, or anything greater if I take the absolute value, right? Because if I take the absolute value for my left tail test, well now being greater, I'm actually looking at like larger negative values. And so if we take the absolute value, one way we can say this is the p-value is really just the probability. Once I take the absolute value of my test statistic, or sorry, that the z-value I saw was greater than the absolute value of my test statistic that I found, right? Or we can kind of denote this as the test statistic, right? Z of the, of the sample mean. Okay. So we have differences in the right and left tail tests of how we'll find that p-value. So in practice, if I have a right tail test, once I turn this into my Z statistic, I go to the table, but the table tells me what? The table tells me the area to the left. So if the table tells me, tells me the area to the left for a right tail test, I'm going to have to look that up and then subtract it from one. Any questions on this before we keep, keep moving here? Because the next one gets a little bit more tricky. Okay with that? Okay, so we've got left and right tail tests, kind of thinking about their p-values. For a two-tailed test, it's a little bit different, right? So let's use that one where we're saying, well, we assumed it was equal to 67. Let's say I see a sample mean of 64, I would turn that into a Z statistic or a Z value here. 
I could find the probability that I saw something that far away from the assumed true mean or something even further? Or what was the probability I saw that Z value or anything larger in absolute value? Now the problem with the two-tailed test is, if I saw from my sample mean, sorry, if I saw from my sample, the sample mean of 64, it would have been equally as likely for me to see a sample mean that was that far away from the assumed true value, but above it, right? And if it was equally as likely for me to see this value, but now with a two-tailed test, this value would have also went against my null hypothesis, right? So just because I saw this as my sample mean, I know that there, it was equally as likely that I saw a sample mean above this assumed true value that would have been equally as damning evidence against what I assumed to be true. So for a two-tailed test, I can look up the probability that I saw my sample mean or anything further away from the assumed true value. But I have to remember, it was equally as likely for me to see something that many standard deviations away from the assumed true mean on the other side of the distribution. So whatever area I look up, I know that I have an equally sized area on the other side. And so I'll just multiply this by two. Right? So for a two tail, and the reason why that doesn't occur in the one tail test is because for a one tail test, if I had found evidence on the other side of the distribution, well, that actually would have been evidence that supported the null, right? Because only one side mattered on that one side test. Only one side was sample means that went against the null hypothesis. Now in the two tail test, evidence on either side of that assumed true value goes against the null. So written a little bit more formally than what I just said, or kind of went through on the board, for a right tailed test or a greater than test, we want the probability that the z-score is greater than the test statistic we found, right? Or we're looking at the right side of that distribution. For a less than or a left tailed test, we want the probability we saw a z-score that was less than the test statistic that we found. For a two tailed test, right? It kind of depends. If we find a positive test statistic, let's say we saw this as our sample mean, we would find the area in the right tail multiplied by two. But if we had seen a negative test statistic, something below that assumed true mean, we would have found the area to the left and then multiplied that by two. Now, one way we can kind of get around that is really what we're saying there is, if I took the absolute value of that test statistic, I'm just finding the probability that I'm greater than the absolute value of the test statistic and then multiplying it by two. So hopefully once as we go through more examples, this will become like a little bit more clear. We won't have to remember the kind of formal definitions. We'll just kind of get used to this practice. Okay. So here's kind of a synopsis of what I had up on the board there to an extent, right? Left tailed, right tailed, two tailed test. And we make our rejection decision by if the p value is less than alpha. Okay. So the steps that we'll have every single time determine our null and alternative hypothesis specify what alpha level or what significance level we want to find, take our sample mean, turn it into a test or a Z statistic, using that test statistic, find the p-value, right? Looking that up in the table, standard normal distribution table. If the p-value is less than the alpha that we chose, we'll reject. If it's not, we fail to reject. Okay. So let's kind of work through this example completed, right? So this is the same example we had earlier. I think I accidentally changed the name of the beer here. I, I think I kept the brand the same and, and chose a different one, but that, that's irrelevant. So uh, we have a sample size of 36, our population variance of one. Can we reject the null hypothesis if alpha was kind of set at 0 0.05 or the 5% significance level? Okay. Well, we've worked through everything. We had our null alternative. We said we had a left tailed test. So once we found our test statistic, and that's really just gonna be once we have that equation for the test statistic, it's just a matter of plugging things into that equation. So we get a test statistic of negative 15. Hopefully by this point, we realize that a test statistic of negative 15 is absurd, right? If I look up a test statistic of negative 15 in my standard normal distribution table, what's the area to the left of that? Approximately, yeah, zero, nothing, right? Yeah, because I mean, when we go to the table, let's see, hopefully I still have it pulled up. The lowest value we have on here is what? Negative 0.399. And even the area to the left of negative 3.99 is zero. So if I, I go out even further to negative 15, I've just got a probability or an area that's even closer to zero. 
So my p-value here in this example would be essentially zero. So if I have a p-value of zero, can I reject at the 5% significance level? We make our rejection decision if, by if the p-value is less than the alpha we choose, right? Then we can reject. Well, here, clearly zero is less than 0 0.05, right? So our p-value is approximately zero, so we're definitely gonna be able to reject the null, right? And what this is saying really is that if the assumed true value that I had of 7% was in fact the true population mean, the probability that I saw a sample mean that was 15 standard deviations, remember the Z statistic is the number of standard deviations away from that assumed true value. So the probability of seeing a sample mean that was this many standard deviations away from the assumed true mean is essentially zero. So if the probability of seeing that is essentially zero, I know that this probably isn't the true mean. So I'm rejecting the null or I'm rejecting that this is in fact true. Because based off the sample evidence I found of a sample mean of 4.5, you know, it's almost impossible I would have seen that as my sample mean if in fact the null hypothesis was true here. Okay. Any questions on that? I want to do one more thing. So I, I know earlier I mentioned, you know, I've got this entire range here, greater than or equal to 7%. But why am I just choosing that 7%, right? Because in this range, why didn't I choose 8.3 or 9.1? Well, notice, if I think about finding my p-value, so we have this set up, here's my sample means. If I assume it's centered around 7%, I see that sample mean of 4.5. I turn that into a Z that score, and I find the probability that I saw that or anything below it, right? That's how I found my p-value. Well, if my p-value is less than alpha, when the assumed true mean is 7%, if I would have used any other value, so let's just say I assumed, because the null was that it was greater than or equal to seven, let's assume that I chose 8% as the assumed true mean. Well, I know for sure that for any value that's higher than 7% here, that if these were the true population means and the distribution of my sample means kind of shifts, well, now what's true about saying 4.5? It's even less likely than it was before. Well, if it's less likely than it was before, what that's really telling me is that you know, 4.5 is 15 standard deviations away from 7. It's going to be more than 15 standard deviations away from 80. So it's really going to be looking at kind of making the area in my tail smaller here or increasing that test statistic, which makes my p-value smaller. Well, if my p-value is getting smaller, it becomes less likely that I would reject the null there as well. So if I can reject it at seven, I'll for sure be able to reject every other value in that range. That's why we can choose that kind of lowest cutoff value in that null hypothesis and say, look, if I can reject 7%, I actually am rejecting every value above that as well. Okay. Any questions on that? I'll leave kind of this screen up for the, the video. So I know this is a lot. <laughs> um, and I know that kind of these concepts are difficult. So we'll walk through some more examples on Friday's class. We're then going to look at how would we do this in Excel, right? It's actually really, we already have the tools that we need. It's really just applying this and kind of seeing what it would look like in Excel. But we'll go through more examples. We'll go through some Excel examples on Friday. We'll probably even start to, I don't know if we'll finish, but we'll introduce the idea of looking at sample proportions and doing hypothesis testing with sample proportions. Um, but I'm not sure if we'll quite get there. I really wanna make sure we have a good base for what this hypothesis testing is. I'll probably do some more review. Another way of thinking about what our type one error, what that alpha is really representing. Um, like I guess I'll probably hold off on the type two error until Monday, but uh, we might introduce the critical value approach as well. I'm not sure exactly how far we'll get Friday. So. An Excel assignment that you currently have is due at the end of the day on Friday. So start getting any last minute questions, hopefully to me today or tomorrow. Uh, last minute questions on Friday. You know, I teach a, a large majority of the day um, and it kinda, it'll be difficult for me to get, get you responses quicker on Friday. So try to get those out of the way here today and tomorrow. Other than that, um, 
I'll probably get an online quiz with like a question up there um, after class. So make sure you do that prior to class on Friday. No questions for me. I'll see you guys on Friday.